Um, I'd like to start by uh, just introducing the problem that I want to talk about. So I'm going to talk about a computational problem or a statistical problem where we try to infer uh, some parameters and specifically the parameters that we want to infer are the uh, ancestry of individuals. So the most kind of general problem is that you have a set of genotypes, a set of individuals, and you want to find uh, each individual. You want to know where they are from. So you want to know that one of them is from Asia, another one from Europe, and so on. And uh, so there's a question that seems in, uh, kind of uh, basic and, and fundamental to me, which is how uh, well can we do this, given a specific data set, given a specific method, or what's the best method that we could use to do this? Um, so how accurate can we be? So let's say instead of looking at the world, can we look at uh, Europe and say from which countries each person is from? And maybe we can go even further and say from which city is each person from and I don't know, which neighborhood. OK, so, so this is, the, uh, this is the, the problem setting. And uh, before I go, I dive into the methods themselves, I'd like to say a few words about why uh, I and, and, and ma many others think that this is a uh, an important problem, and it's been studied quite a bit in the last uh, 15 years. So some motivation. So uh, this uh, picture, you, probably some of you have, have seen it before in my slides or other people's slides. So this is uh, data from Esteban Borchan, and this is actually an old slide uh, where they had uh, back then 90 samples. And the out, that's the output of the program structure of uh, uh, Jonathan Pritchard, who's here. And so what you can see here is that every, uh, so you have 90 samples, and each sample has this rectangle with three different colors. The different colors correspond to the different um, ancestries. So in this case, we're looking at Puerto Rican population. Puerto Ricans, in general, you can say that uh, there's three ma major ancestries that, uh, that came to Puerto Rico. One is Europeans, Africans, and uh, Native Americans. So you can see here that every individual has a different ancestry. So they're all Puerto Ricans, but this guy here is 100% uh, European, and this guy here is 85% Native American. They would all identify themselves as, as Puerto Ricans, but genetically, they're different, and they have different ancestries. Uh, a few years later, Esteban and his group, they uh, collected more data. Actually, now they have much more data, but uh, this is uh, from two or three years ago, I guess. And you see two populations here. The top population is the Mexicans. The bottom population is the Puerto Ricans. <coughs> and uh, what you can see, so these, the three right populations here are the Europeans, Africans, and Native Americans. And you can see even between the Puerto Ricans and the uh, Mexicans, there's, a, there's differences, right? There's differences in, in the sense that the ancestry, the African ancestry, the Native American ancestry, and the European ancestry are distributed differently in the two populations. And potentially, let's say, well, you know, we kind of know the history of these, of these uh, places, but if we didn't know the history of these places, we could theoretically um, know something about the history of, of these two places just by looking at them, right? So I mean, by looking at this graph. So uh, for instance, you, know, you see that there's much less, much more uh, African population in Puerto Rico. That tells you something about the migration from Africa to uh, to Puerto Rico, right? So it's maybe not very quantitative this way, but it's still, you can, you can see easily, even from this picture, that you have a lot of information about what happened in the past based on uh, what you see in these pictures. So these populations specifically are admixed populations. And uh, when you think about admixed population, you think about populations that maybe 10, 20, 30 generations ago, that's at least recently admixed population, or like uh, in a uh, Nick Patterson's talk. So I'm talking about rec very recent admix, admixtures. So let's say 20 generations ago, uh, 500 years ago, the Africans and the Europeans, before the uh, Africans were brought to the, to the Americas, then they basically didn't really meet. So we had two populations that were separated for a long time, and then they started uh, mixing. After the first generation, you have three types of individuals, individuals that both their parents are uh, red, individuals that both their parents are blue, and individuals that have one red chromosome and one blue chromosome. After a few, uh, after a few generations, due to 
recombinations, you'll have uh, this mosaic. So every individual is basically going to be a mosaic of red and blue populations. So the, this is what we have in the genomes of the individuals. And one of the basic problems here is how to identify these regions. When is an individual a red, uh, a red uh, ancestry, and when is it a blue ancestry? And there's been a lot of methods, including from our groups, uh, from our group that uh, try to do this. And again, why is this useful? So uh, one of the basic, uh, one of the most important reasons for this is that this can be used when you look when you look for genes that are associated with disease. So imagine, so this technique is called admixture mapping, and the basic idea is that you have, let's say that you map the genomes of individuals, and you know in every position whether the individual is blue or red. And now you're looking for regions such as this one, which are enriched in the red population or in the blue population. So this would be an in interesting region. And, uh, and then you'd say that this region is associated with the disease. So you're taking individuals that are cases. I forgot to mention that. So the assumption is, so let's say I take African Americans that are cases, and I'm looking for European ancestry in a specific region, uh, and then I suspect that they have an enrichment in this European ancestry because there is a gene over there that is associated, or there's a SNP that's associated with, um, with the disease. So admixture mapping has been widely used uh, across many different uh, phenotypes, you need the, there's a few things you need to have in order for this to work. Uh, specifically, you need to have a different prevalence in the, uh, between the two, um, the two, you know, the African and Europeans. If you're looking at African uh, African Americans, for instance, and uh, you need to have also a different allele frequency between the two populations. The other thing which is useful when you look at a, at a, this kind of data, and that was demonstrated in two different papers, one of them by uh, John November's group and the other one by uh, David Reich's group, that you could look at this information and, and see that, uh, and calculate the recombination rates, basically. So every point, every breakpoint that goes from blue to red, or red to blue, is an evidence for the fact that you had recombination in the last 20 generations in this case. So you can just count, essentially, how many do you have in every region, and that gives you an estimate of how uh, likely is it to, to have a recombination in a specific region. So that's a kind of a motivation to why would one want to do this kind of thing. Another very important motivation, which is, I assume, again, um, in this case, probably uh, everybody, or like 98% of the audience would know this. So there's a lot, uh, uh, there's been a lot of studies in the last 10 years, I guess, uh, of genome-wide association studies where uh, people have been looking at the entire genome, and they were looking for SNPs that are associated with a specific disease. So you take cases and controls, or you take a continuous phenotype, and you're trying to, to correlate that phenotype with a SNP. So this map shows, uh, it's actually pretty old, it's from 2010, but it, what it shows is uh, every point here corresponds to a SNP that was associated with a specific phenotype. The colors correspond to the different phenotypes. And today you already have thousands of these SNPs that are associated with, with phenotypes. Now, in order to do this, uh, the analysis there, you must take into account the fact that maybe, for instance, the ca you collected cases and controls from different populations. Because if you collect cases and controls from different populations, then you'll see a lot of false positives. A lot of SNPs that are going to be, are going to have different allele frequencies between the cases and the controls are going to look as if they are associated with the disease, but uh, they're just associated with the fact that uh, these come from different populations. And if you, so this picture is actually from a paper by Young et al. Uh, in Nature Genetics 2011, and what you see here is a typical thing of, um, that's a QQ plot of the expected p-value compared to the observed p-value with and without adjusting for the population structure. And in fact, this is a, a, I kind of like this example because what it, it shows, what they showed in this paper is they, they looked at, um, so they looked at basically at children, they started with, uh, with uh, uh, Latino children that, um, that had leukemia and they treated them and they wanted to see who responds to the treatment and who doesn't. 
So these were the cases in the controls. They couldn't find anything when they did just the, uh, the normal GWAS, but they did find that if they look at the Native American ancestry that they get uh, children with more than 10% Native American ancestry uh, have uh, three times more chance of, of basically not responding to the treatment. So this is kind of, the ancestry itself was, uh, what, was what, what gave the prediction, but you couldn't find any specific SNP. You could then also look at the local specific ancestry and you'd see that you have some uh, SNPs that are, or regions that, are, uh, that have uh, enrich, enrichment for Native American ancestry, so that's kind of the admixture mapping idea. Okay, so, so this was motiv the motivation, and uh, I want to talk about a little bit about what are the current frameworks, or, uh, or current and previous frameworks for, for uh, uh, ancestry inference. So, again, in the most basic setting, what we have is some type of a clustering problem. You, think, you can think of a mixture model where you want to give to every individual, in this case, three numbers that will tell you uh, what's the fraction of the uh, European, African, and Native American ancestry. And you can do it in a supervised setting, and you can do it in an unsupervised setting. Okay, so all of these um, frameworks have been explored. And again, you can look at the level of the SNP, which will be local specific ancestry, and you can look at the level of the entire genome, which will give you just the global ancestry. So again, there's been dozens of methods that of, uh, that are doing this, and there's, uh, there's differences between them. But the, the most basic idea, if I take out, if I just kind of try to simplify it, is the following. That you, if you have a set of uh, population, in this case three populations, I, and again, I'm looking at, this is actually true both in the supervised and the unsupervised case, but <coughs> let, let's just think about the supervised case. I have Europeans. I have Africans and I have Asians, and let's say that I have these three populations. Some I co collected samples from these three populations, and then I see that in the first SNP I, I have an, a little frequency of 30% for the Europeans, 20% for the Africans, 20% for the Asians. For the second SNP I have 10%, 20%, and 10%, and so on. So I can measure for every SNP what's the allele frequency in each population. Again, in the unsupervised case, I have to kind of learn both things together. I have to learn both which ones are the ancestral population and which ones are the SNPs, uh, which ones are the allele frequencies. So I have to learn the entire matrix. In the supervised case, it's a little bit easier. But once I have this, then I can use this now as a model. Okay, so uh, I can think about it as a generative model. And now when I see an individual, now I get a new individual, I want to know whether this individual is African, European, or Asian in this case or maybe a mix, but let's just say that I want to say if the person is one of the three, then I can just write down the likelihood. So if I see that the person is homozygous A, and I know that the, the, the probability for A is P, then it's just going to be P squared, and again, A, G, it's going to be 2P, 1 minus P, and so on. And I can just multiply everything, or just take the log, likely, li log likelihood, and this is going to be the log likelihood of a specific SNP. So this is the most simple idea. And um, again, it's still very useful, even if you just use, uh, maybe, maybe I'll talk for just a second, for, for just a minute about this idea. So when the fir first time I started thinking about this problem, um, I was thinking, I was basically looking at the data and I, was, uh, and I ran structure specifically. And I saw that structure can take Africans and Europeans and just with a few hundred SNPs find the structure, essentially cluster them. Not too many SNPs. Now, if you try to think about it theoretically, and again, I'm trying to aim this to the theoretical computer science uh, uh, in the audience here, or maybe the others that are going to be interested in that, if you try to analyze this and say, how come structure can do this with so, many, so few SNPs, it's not clear. It's not completely clear that you can do this. And actually, the first analysis that you do is you just say, well, let's say I have a SNP, and I have a bunch of SNPs, and they're independent. I can apply a Chernoff bound. And I can see that there is a concentration around each of the, uh, so uh, uh, around each of these vectors, right? So essentially, it's kind of a, if, if you know more than a normal, kind of a normal concentration. So turn of one would be the equivalent of the normal concentration. And then you then you uh, you should eventually 
see that, that, Af that, that an African is an African and a European is a European. But if you, you know, if you put the math together and you try to use this churn of bounds, you get that to, to the math tells you that you need about 10,000 SNPs, not a few hundred SNPs. And so I kind of thought about it together actually with a, a group here in Berkeley with Satish Rao. And uh, we tried to think about what, why is it the case. And uh, what we found is that really what you need is not only the length of the, of the number of SNPs that is important, but also the number of individuals. And we came, to, we came up with bounds that uh, use the entire matrix, the size of the entire matrix, and essentially the FST between the two populations in order to tell, to, you know, to tell you what's the upper bound and actually lower bound, and, and they're tight in this case, uh, of what you need to do. And we, we did get to something which is about, I mean, we didn't really care about the exact constants, but it was a few hundred uh, SNPs. So it, it's, it's not, I, I think it's not completely intuitive that it should work as well as it does, but it, it works really well, as, at least if the, uh, SNP, if the populations are far enough from each other. Okay, now, um, so there's more sophisticated methods, and uh, again, different groups have been working on this. We uh, recently had a, a method that we called uh, LAMP-LD that basically uses both the uh, linkages equilibrium, we use this kind of uh, uh, HMM model that takes the two populations together in windows. I'm not gonna get into this, uh, into the details, but the basic idea here is that you look at all the SNPs and you think about an, a model that uh, that allows you for the re kind of recombination. It's not really recombinations because you're not uh, uh, you, you're not modeling exactly the population genetics here, but you give a descriptive model of uh, a descriptive generative model for the sequence. Now, so we and, again, others, there's at least four or five other methods that are trying to do this, uh, have been doing this, and each, one, each time there was a, a paper came out and gave a, a little bit better uh, accuracy. On the African-Americans, the accuracy is really, uh, you know, as I said before, it's with a few hundred SNPs you can do it, so it's very easy to do this. Also on the local, the lo local specific ancestry is very easy to do. When you go to the Latino population, it's a little bit more difficult but still, again, based on simulations, we get to, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's in the high 90s, right? 95, 96% accuracy. But we also wondered about what, uh, what happens in, if you try to do something which is not, to evaluate it without looking at uh, simulations. And uh, it's not clear exactly how to do this, uh, but what we, what we did is we took, uh, again, Esteban uh, Burchard's data from UCSF, he has trios, mother, father, and child, and you can ask the following question. Let's say that I give the mother, the father, and the child, the three of them, to the program, LAMP-LD, or any of the other methods that are there. We tried it on four different methods, actually. And, uh, and then you just ask whether there are, there are Mendelian inconsistencies between uh, what you get for the father, for the mother, and the child. So I, Mendelian inconsistency, I mean that if, let's say that you have, that you say that the mother is African, the father is European, sorry, the mother and the father are African and the child is European in a specific position. So that's obviously there's a mistake somewhere in one of them. Okay, so, uh, and we did that, and what we found is that overall, like you expect, we, uh, you know, the results of the simulations are a bit too optimistic, but it didn't sound like they're, very optimistic, okay, it was up to the kind of a constant. But in some regions in the genome, the errors were much higher. So for instance, in the HLA region, you know, and in the telomeres, there's regions in the, in the genome that are much uh, more difficult to, to work with, probably because we, all these methods assume that there is a neutrality, all these uh, uh, methods assume that uh, the recombination rates are kind of known or they try to estimate them, again, based on neutrality. So in uh, regions such as the HLA, this is not, probably not so uh, easy to do because there is probably selection and probably maybe the recombination rates are not well estimated over there. So this is kind of uh, uh, still, a, I'd say, kind of a black hole in the sense that we don't really know the, the answer for these specific reasons, but for the, most of the genome we get 
reasonable results again when we look at Latinos. So if you go for to four or five a mixture of four or five populations, it's probably a harder problem, and we don't really know uh, how do these methods work. Okay, so the next or, or another type of uh, um, ancestry inference that you could do is you could think maybe I don't want to cluster them because this is kind of arbitrary. Maybe I want to think about the whole thing as a continuum. Okay, so uh, this is a, a famous picture from Carlos's, Carlos's paper from 2008 together with John November. And uh, what you see here is the uh, POPRES data, which is data of European uh, pe people with European ancestry. And this is just a PCA map, PC1 and PC2. The colors correspond to uh, the, the country of origin, right? So you have this, this is the map of Europe, and you see the, the country of uh, origin. And if it's the first time you see it, then you're probably kind of, it's, it's really surprising. If, you, if you've seen it 20 times, then maybe it, it seems like very normal. But it's first time you see it, it's, it's, it's really surprising. It's very, it, so it's, it's surprising. Why? Because, you know, you don't really, it's not, completely clear, you, you're doing PCA, right? It's kind of magic. Why, would, why should it work? Why should the first two PCs correspond to geography? Maybe they should correspond to something else, right? Maybe PC3 should correspond to geography. It's not completely clear that it should work, well, but it works. Before we ran the corrections, PC2 corresponds to the day the samples were run. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you need, so if you don't do any QC here, then you're not, you're not gonna get it. You're not gonna get it. So it's, it's, it's not, um, yeah, so, so that's a good point, Carlos. Okay, so, so the thing is, um, there is still a disadvantage when you use PCA because PCA uh, doesn't, it basically assumes linearity and that means that you can't really, you don't have this generate, you know, probabilistic, probabilistic generative model that I showed you before with uh, models like structure or lamp and things like that. So. And you can say, well, you know, why do I care? My, why do I need this, this generative model? But the thing is, if you want to think about individuals that are diploids and not haploids, then you do want to use this, this kind of model because uh, if a person is a mix of a Swedish and Italian, for instance, then PCA would give you a point in the middle, right? And it's, it's just because they, you just take the average of the two, essentially. Okay, so, but if you have a model, a probabilistic model that uh, is explicit, you could potentially tell apart the two parents. Okay, I'm not saying that it's easy, and it's, you know, from our experiments, it's not so easy to get at least not that accuracy, but, uh, but you can get relative, you know, reasonable accuracy. I'll show you a bit later. Okay, so, uh, together with Elazar Eskin here and with John November, we uh, thought about, you know, we, we basically were in UCLA and we thought, uh, you know, how, how, how should we do that? And we started thinking about explicit models for, um, explicit model for continuous, continuum of spatial ancestry, basically. So the basic, the, the, mo the simplest idea that you could use, which is essentially what you use eventually, is, is the following. So you have, let's say that you have uh, Spanish, Germans, and Russians, and you have 20, a SNP with a 20% mi uh, minor relative frequency in Spain, 50% in Germany, and 80% in Russia. Then if you have now a French person, then you expect the French person to be somewhere between Spain and Germany for, you know, for most SNPs, maybe not all of them, but for many, many of the SNPs. And so we expect the little frequency in France to be something like 35%. So what we did is we said, okay, so let's think about the following model. Let's have a model that says that given that you're from point x, y on the map, I'll have an allele frequency which is a function of x and y. It's a continuous function of x and y, okay? And this continuous function has to have a, a few properties. So one of the properties is that it has, it's a, it's a probability. It has to be a number between zero and one. And the other one, at least well, the first thing we wanted to try was to say that we want to have some kind of linearity. Okay, so it's not exactly, we can't have it as exact linear function because it's, then it's not going to 
be between 0 and 1, but then it's easy to do because you can just take uh, sigmoids. Right, so this function is essentially a linear function which is uh, bounded between 0 and 1. So, so you put, really this is kind of a map of a specific SNP. And in this, um, in this map, you see that, I don't know, if you go to, let's say, Turkey, you'll have a 10% minor little frequency for that SNP. If you go to England, you'll have something like 70% and so on. Okay, so, so the entire map of Europe is, um, you have for every specific point here, you have an allele frequency that it is determined by this function. And we, we call this function slope functions. So, so then the question is, uh, how do you fit? Now you have a probabilistic model. Now you have to fit the model, basically to fit the parameters. Um, so we just write the likelihood. The problem is that the, the, if you want to maximize the likelihood, this is not a convex problem, and it's not very easy to optimize. But luckily, we observed that uh, if you fix the positions, so these are the positions of the individuals, then I can try now to estimate these maps for each of the SNPs. So this is the likelihood function. And so the sum is over all the individuals and then sum over all the SNPs of the likelihood function that I showed you before, where the Fs are simply these slope functions. Okay? So what you can see here is that if I fix the individuals, then the problem of uh, maximizing the likelihood just breaks down so that every SNP can be maximized separately. So every SNP now has a just summation over all the individuals, and it's only really two parameters, three parameters, because we have this B, and A is a vector of size 2. So it's like three parameters that we have to estimate for every SNP from the entire genome. It's very, very easy and relatively uh, fast to do this step. OK, so this is if you have the positions of the individuals. The thing is, if you have the, the maps, you can easily find the positions in exactly the same way, essentially. So you basically now fix these maps. So the A's and the B's are fixed. And the functions now are just functions of x. And again, it's a convex function. OK, and you can separate it for every individual you have uh, a maximization problem for that individual, right? You don't have to maximize it for all the individuals together. And so, what, so in the actual data, there's very few mutations that like started in Central Europe and are just peaked there in the middle. Uh, okay, so when when we, the answer is yes. Because, I don't know if very few, but the majority of the of them are not like that. But when we started working on the data, we didn't know. Okay, and we just said actually what we said we'll just try that. And it's probably not going to work, and then we'll try to think about something smarter, but that worked. So, okay. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so th there's a chicken and egg problem here. We don't really know if we want to do the unsupervised case at least. We don't really know the positions. We don't really know the maps. But we can just iterate. We start with random set of uh, positions, and then we find the best maps. And then we find once we, the maps are known, we find the the best positions, and so on. So we tried that on the Popper's data. I'll just say again what it is. Uh, that's the same data that uh, John and Carlos used for um, the PCA map that I showed you before. Uh, so there's uh, 1385 individuals here, uh, and that was done. We have 500,000 SNPs. And each individual out of these 1,400 individuals has four grandparents that came from the same country. OK? So remember, it's the same country. It doesn't mean you know, Spain is big, France is big, Germany is big. It doesn't, it's not the best data. It would have been better to get the same city. But like, that's, that's what we have right now. OK, so what you see here is the starting point. We just put them in, like, in a random in a set of random positions. And uh, I'm going to show you a quick movie and show you how, how it uh, converges. So it's, it's going to repeat three times. But you see the first time? So it basically, basically converges to, uh, to the map. Uh, and you know if you look at it carefully, you can see that there's a bit of differences between what you get here and what you get with the PCA. Uh, but you know, qualitatively, it's, it's it's very similar the, in terms of, we call the method SPA. 
the median error is, is somewhat lower, about 10% lower than PCA. So we get 250 kilometers uh, instead of 280 kilometers. So the distance is to the, you know, each, again, the, it, to each, we don't know what, where in the country did they come from, so we go, we go to the uh, biggest city. Yes? Um, we don't, but in principle, I think this this is a very interesting problem. We looked at the uh, we looked at the SNPs that have the uh, largest slopes, and these were you know LCT, HLA, and so on. So these are uh, regions that are known to be or many of them were known to be under selection, uh, and you know we found a few others that we, you know are not necessarily known to be under selection. So it could could be that there are under selection, but we don't really have a proof of that because there's no neutral model here, so it's very difficult to prove it. But in principle, I think, you know, that's kind of one of the, in my last slide, I have this uh, bullet that says, you know, that I think it's kind of a very interesting open question to see what can you learn from these slope functions or maybe other slope functions about demography, about population genetics parameters. Yes? Can you do anything to enforce that there's like Water where people don't live, or does it actually no, yeah, that's a, again a great question, and that's that's something you can easily add. You can basically add to this. This is a likelihood model. You can add a prior, and the prior could be based on what you know that is going on in the map. You can say here there's mountains and here there's water. So, you know, you could you could easily do this, and you can add, even using the you know you can put the prior so that you know that if. If you look at, uh, at the map, in the bigger city, you should have more people. In the smaller towns, there's less people. You have some information that we don't really use. So this is completely, you know, tabula rasa. I mean, like, we don't have, we don't know anything. We don't use any information. Yes? So I honestly don't understand. How, does, how do you get Spain in the lower left? Why doesn't it, why doesn't the map? Oh, uh, the this, yeah, that's, okay. So this is after uh, I moved it uh, so that, you know, like that. <laughs> okay. So these kilometers, actually, if you just do PCA or you just do SPA without correcting, there's no without correcting for this, uh, you know, rotating it, and then and actually rotating is, is not enough. You you basically rotate it and then you regress it. Okay. So it's it's you need to do some kind of a linear transformation because especially you can see it easily. You can easily see it from SPA because there's no uh, I can always multiply everything by two, right? Uh, you know, so all right, it, it's it's still going to be the same, the, the optimal solution, right? So, okay. So, the next step is really to try to account uh, for uh, linkage disequilibrium. This work is um, with uh, Yael Baran, my student, and with uh, Bogdan Pasanyuk from UCLA, and. So you want to account for LD. LD, again, for the uh, theory people in the audience, it's basically just assumed that there's correlations between uh, SNPs. And usually, this correlation is going to be between SNPs that are very close to each other in the genome. So, so the first question is, why do we even care about LD? And, um, and here is at least one reason. So if you look at the at the SPA model, we basically assume that the SNPs are independent. Now, it may not be too bad, but maybe it is bad. It's not really clear, right? This is the result that we have for SPA for a Spanish population. Um, from, uh, so this, this population is from Spain, and the colors correspond to the different regions in Spain that they're from. So it could be, so this color, these guys are from Galicia, and these guys, I, I believe, are from the Basque country, I can't remember now. Uh, and these guys are from all over Spain, as you can see. So it's kind of a mix. It doesn't really work very well when we look at, um, at, Sp at Spain. Okay. If we run PCA, then we get this result here. So again, you, you have some structure. It's not that you don't have any structure. But you can't really make any inference now about migration patterns in Spain based on that. Right? I mean, you, you wouldn't want to do something like that here. So it's not, you know, it's, we always see the map of Europe, and then we say, oh, PCA works great. Yeah, it works great. And again, after the QC that Carlos did, right? But, uh, but then even after QC, you just get this kind of uh, phenomenon. And 
what you can see, it may be hard to see, but there's like the second PC is actually not really geography. The second PC, what it corresponds to is an inversion in chromosome 8. Okay, so this is if I only look at the chromosome 8 region of the inversion, this is what I guess. What I get, the same thing as the, as the second PC. So it's, do, it's a very long inversion of a few megabases, and there's very high LD over there because of the inversion. So, uh, so there's a problem over there, and this problem was known also before. You know, it's not that we found, the, we found it specifically with this data, but people looked at, the, at, uh, at LD and PCA specifically. And, and actually also LD and local specific ancestry, and so that the, it can cause uh, problems. Okay, so, sorry, this is. Okay, so what we do is we try to do, to, to, what we try to do is we try to say, okay, so let's now think about slope functions that take into account LD. Okay, so the same framework as SPA, but now let's get better, better uh, slope functions. Oh, Different slope function, but this one, this time, slope functions also take into account the LD. So what we do is we do again something relatively simple. What we do is we say, let's split the genome into uh, non-overlapping windows, and in each window we have a string gij, which is that individual i uh, window j. So again, this is a string. It's not just one snip. Now it's it's a set of snips. And uh, we are going to assume that uh, in this region we have a multivariate norm. The, the, basically, the gene G comes from a multivariate normal distribution with variance covariance matrix that is fixed across Europe in this case, or across Spain, across the region. But the mean depends on the uh, position of the individual. Okay. So again, this you can think of it as, as again a linear function, but this time I'm taking into account the correlations. So again, I can just write down the likelihood and the likelihood of the, of the uh, genotypes given basically the, this is for one window, for beta j and sigma j. Uh, so this is just the multivariate normal uh, likelihood. What's nice about it, so one of the things that happened with SPA is that it, it turned out, I mean, I, I showed you this picture, but it actually takes a long time to run. And uh, one of the nice features of this, uh, this formulation is that we have a closed form optimization given, oh, wow, just two minutes, given each one of the, uh, of the parameters. So if I fix sigma, then I can easily get x and beta. If I fix fix better, then I, get, I can get the other ones and so on. So I'm going to skip how we do this. This is just formulas that you get by solving this. So again, given the positions, I can just get beta and sigma. And uh, given sigma, I can basically get uh, x. Given sigma and beta, I can get x. So uh, let me show you some results. Uh, so one thing that we see is that if we take SPA, sorry, this is PCA, SPA, and we call it local, localization correction for LD. Um, so we take the three of them. You see that if you increase the number of SNPs that you're using, this is the R, R square threshold. So if I just prune the data with 0.2, let's say you use Plink or any other, basically just take every two SNPs. If they have an R square of more than 0.2, then throw away one of them. Uh, and this is the same thing for 0.5 and so on. We get to a situation where um, uh, with here we get worse and worse results, and here we actually get better and better results when we increase the number of SNPs. We compare the method to PCA, but uh, on all the SNPs to PCA on data that is pruned with 0.2 actually, to smart PCA, which is uh, a method uh, by uh, Nick Patterson and Alcus Price and David Reich that basically uses, uh, also tries to look at LD for PCA. And uh, SPA and SPA pruned. And you can see that the, that the results are uh, improved compared to SPA. It's now it's two, uh, 211 uh, kilometers. So let me, um, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip a few of, the, of these slides. I want to get to uh, so a few specific points and then summarize. 
Okay, so one thing that we just realized recently is that there is this, you know, so we have these two methods. We have SPA, we have LOCO, and we have PCA, three methods. And it seems that there is a lot of things in common to these methods. We started thinking about, for instance, we, we looked at what happens when you have rare variants and they all kind of behave the same. They don't work. Don't try it with rare variants. And, um, you know, so, uh, and then we looked at some asymptotic things that would happen and they all seem to be very, to behave similarly. And, and then what, uh, you know, I started to think about what, what's the relation between them. And so you can write down what is the optimization function for local. And just to, because uh, I'm running out of time, I'll just tell you kind of the, the, uh, what we find. So we find that if we look at window size one, you can think of windows uh, of local with window size one, okay? And sigma equals the identity. So I force sigma, the standard deviation, to be uh, one. In this case, we can prove, and the proof was here, but I didn't get to it, that, uh, that we get the, that the PCA is the solution. Okay? So PCA can be thought of as a specific, a, a special case of local. Okay? Now, um, and, and then, in fact, what we can say, say is that if sigma is not necessarily the identity, then PCA, but it's fixed, then the solution of sigma to the minus half times the genotype data gives you, um, the, that PCA gives you the optimal solution of local. Okay, and that, this kind of uh, thought get, got us to uh, an unsupervised algorithm for uh, local with L equals one. You simply run PCA, and then uh, you find the sigma. Then you optimize the sigma, and you iterate. And you get to something like that. You get the sigma in the optimal solution. You get that the sigma uh, j that you have is the variance. Uh, you kind of, uh, you, can, you can think about it the, in the following way. You, when you use PCA, sometimes what you do is you, you actually want to do this. You want to standardize your, uh, each of your features, right? So you just normalize each of the features. That's what you do in, in PCA. So you just divide by the standard deviation. What we do here is we calculate the standard deviation, but the standard deviation is based on the mean allele frequency, mean frequency of the mean allele frequency of that SNP based on the geography of that individual that we learn during this iterative process. And this can sometimes be useful. Actually, in every every attempt that I did in, ter in terms of simulation so far, it always gave better results. Sometimes you can't really see it by eye, but if you measure qu quantitatively, what's the uh, you know, you start with two populations. You see that you get a better separation of the two populations when you use uh, this kind of method. So this is even without looking at LD again. This is just looking at, uh, at using this sigma. And this example here is just PCA when you have 10,000 SNPs, out of them 20 SNPs with minor little frequency. So all the SNPs are the same for the two populations. Okay, I'm done. All the SNPs are the same for the two, uh, for the, uh, two, pop the two populations. All the SNPs are the same for all of them. 20 SNPs have a minor little frequency of 0.85 in one population and 0.15 in the other one. This is what you get with PCA, and this is what you get with LOCO with this kind of method. So it, in some cases, it can be, uh, you can see it. Again, there's some relation between PCA and SPA. I'm not going to get into it, but uh, essentially you can show that PCA actually has the same slope functions as SPA, but it uses some kind of regularization. When it, uh, that's essentially what it does. Okay, so just a summary. Uh, I wanted to kind of put out some open questions that I think are interesting. And I'm, again, because I'm out of time, I'm not going to say too much about, uh, about them. But the first one is, uh, what are really the correct, I'm putting it in parentheses because it's not clear if the, the, there are correct slow functions. Okay, so can we come up with better slow functions that, that are based on population genetics uh, parameter, basically, that explain the migration and uh, uh, I don't know, the FST, the selection, and so on. And, so, and then I'll jump to the last one, which was related to the question that uh, someone asked here. Uh, it would be really interesting, I think, to try to understand what's the relation between uh, what we see here, the picture that we see from LOCO, or from other slope functions, and uh, population genetics uh, parameters. So for instance, if you uh, know uh, Gil McVean's paper about 
uh, the relation between PCA and FST, something along these lines I think would be uh, uh, very interesting because I think there's, uh, there's information over there that we could exploit by looking at different slope functions. Maybe different slope functions will tell us different things about the population genetics. Okay, so uh, with that I'm just uh, going to thank. So the first, these are two works that I, worked, uh, that I talked about. The first one with uh, Wen Yun Yang, John November, and Elza Reskin. And the second one with Yael Baran uh, from my lab, Bogdan Pasamik from UCLA, and Ines Quintela and Angel Carcerado from uh, USC, University of Santiago in Compostela. Thank you. So you run a uh, spa in unsupervised mode, right? And the examples you gave where you just don't know the position of anyone and then at the end you rotate and scale. Yeah. So but presumably you can run it in supervised mode pretty easily if you know, if you know the location of the So I'm sorry, so that maybe I wasn't clear there. So we, what I showed you was the unsupervised, right. but the, let's say the table that I showed, these are for the supervised case. Oh. Uh, these ones, you know, the comparison, basically. Okay. These are the, for the supervised, so we can do both. But if the PCA here is run unsupervised, no, it's run supervised because when you so you run PCA on everything, okay? But then uh, this transformation that you do is supervised. Right. Okay. But in in the spa, you could uh, run it in a supervised way. Like you, you could fix a few individuals, and it would also rescale. It wouldn't be just a linear transformation, right? You would also be able to rescale the distances between countries. So, but you can do the same thing with, uh, with this is being done basically when you do the, um, it, you know, in principle you're right, that's not what we do in SPA, but in, in principle you're right that you could maybe start to kind of squeeze the, the, the map. That's not what we try to do over there, so that's not, uh, right, but the, in PCA you also use this, this function. So you can have the, 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 it's the same function that they used in, again, in Carlos and John's day, uh, original paper where you try to do the rotation and uh, regression. So this is the part where you use the um, the supervised part, right? So in SPA we don't go and like try to do something which is nonlinear in this in this right. sense. Well, maybe you can talk about it. Well, can we have last one? Okay, so it's not the case. Thank you very much.